Good morning, everyone. I want to be respectful of your time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to introduce Lori Flynn again. She's going to be going over um, the election report and what that means to H2B and, and further. She has a lot of good information. Her and her team has put a lot of good slides together for us, but a few housekeeping things. I, I do want you to locate your Q&A question option there. You can submit a question at any point in time. We'll be monitoring those and we'll address as many as we can. If you'd like to also use the raise hand option, you can do that and we can unmute your line. But for now, all lines will be muted due to the uh, volume of attendees on the webinar today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lori so we can go ahead and get started. Thank you, Lori. Great. Thanks, Arnufo, and thanks everyone for taking your time today um, to chat with us a little bit about the elections and what do we expect that that will mean for our members. So Arnufo, if you want to go to the next slide, please. So this is obviously the results of the presidential election. I think everyone has seen this at nauseum that Donald Trump won almost all of the uh, swing states and won both the electoral college and the popular vote. We don't need to rehash the election results. What we really want to do is talk about what that means in terms of the H2B and H2A programs and what it means in terms of our advocacy efforts and the things that we are doing on um, H2B reform and H2A reform. So next slide, please. Um, in Congress, we have a Republican Senate, as everyone knows, with a very slim majority, a three seat majority. Um, the two independents um, really caucus with the Democrats from, from Maine and Vermont. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, um, the House, this was done a couple of days ago. And since we did this, report um, and prepare these slides for today. The House is clearly going to be in Republican control. Um, Republicans now control, um, have won elections in 218 seats, which you need 218 to have a majority. Um, there are a couple, uh, just a handful of seats that are still outstanding, but it will be a very slim Republican majority. And um, that means Republicans will have control of the House, the Senate, and the White House. Next slide, please. So we want to talk about what that means in terms of Republican leaders. Longstanding Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell on the Republican side retired from the role and Senator John Thune of South Dakota was elected to um, Senate Majority Leader. In terms of other leadership in the House and Senate, we don't really expect any changes, although the House will vote for their leadership um, early in January. We do expect Mike Johnson to stay in his role and Hakeem Jeffries, but we'll know for sure after those elections. Um, the good thing I will say about Senator John Thune, since folks may not be as familiar with him as the other leaders, is um, he has recognized um, the importance of H2B workers. He wasn't a leader on the issue, but he had um, did recognize and, and help on some efforts on discretionary visas and other things. Next slide, please. Do want to talk a little bit about um, President Trump's platform, what he said during the elections, what the official Republican platform for the Republican convention was, um, and then some other things that will give us a little bit of a clue of what we expect in the immigration and work visa space for the coming year. Um, obviously, President Trump has talked quite a bit about securing the border, doing mass deportations, strictly vetting anyone coming into this country, and, um, you know, here, these bullets here are the official Republican platform that was um, vetted for the Republican National Convention. Project 2025 is not President Trump's platform. He had been very clear to say during the campaign process that he did not endorse Project 2025, but it is a blueprint that was put together by the Heritage Foundation, including a lot of former people in his administration, and they wrote a blueprint for all different sections of the federal government. The section on Homeland Security was written by Ken Cuccinelli, who is the former um, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security in Trump's first term. He was also a senior leader in USCIS, so obviously someone that had been in the Trump inner circle, and that's why it's worth talking about. The Project 25 talks about creating a standalone cabinet um, position that deals with all border and immigration issues, such as 
um, ICE and USCIS and Customs and Border Protection, putting them into one federal agency. It would repeal temporary status, protected status designations for host of immigrants currently living and working in the US under TPS, calls for mandating the use of E-Verify, um, kind of deputizing state and local law enforcement agencies to participate in border security options. And the things I really wanna note here is it specifically says in writing that the new administration should not exercise its discretionary authority to increase the number of H2B visas, that it should not issue any regulations to support H2B eligible countries. The eligible countries list is something that is put out every year by the administration um, that says these countries, you know, we, they respect our immigration laws, have reciprocity, and therefore um, there's no problem bringing in H2B workers for these countries. If there's no eligible country list or you want to bring someone in who's not on the eligible country list, you currently have to make the case that those workers are in the national interest. And so it, this would be a way to, if it were eliminated, to make it um, a little more complicated to bring in H2B workers. It calls for capping the H2A program, which currently isn't capped, and for phasing out the H2A program over 10 to 20 years. And it calls for phasing out the H2B program over 10 years. So again, this is not Trump official proclamations, but knowing that some of those same people have the president's ear, thought it was important to talk about here. Next slide, please. You know, there's a lot of things said in campaigns or said in things like Project 2025 um, that don't actually come to pass. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what the president did in his first term and what we really expect in the second term that could happen. Um, so we do know that in 2018, President Trump issued 15,000 supplemental H2B visas. They were done in June or July, so a little too late for many of our members to take advantage of them. We said too little visas, too late, but it was the first time that that discretionary authority had been in law and that it was exercised and the president used it. Um, in 2019, then he increased that number, his administration, to 30,000 supplemental visas. And I will say the current construct of supplemental visas with set-asides for the Northern Triangle countries and requiring that supplemental visas, if they're not coming from the Northern Triangle countries, um, that they're coming from returning workers. That was a Trump administration construct that's been continued by the Biden administration. Um, in 2020, the administration had outlined plans to increase the number of supplemental visas to 35,000, and then COVID hit. And the president issued restriction on the entry of all non-immigrants due to the COVID pandemic and stopped the planned supplemental release of those 35,000 visas. The good thing was many of our members in landscape and some other industries were able to get their H2B workers by making the case that those workers were in the national security interest of the country, that they had already had contracts with workers, that the work was going to be needed even during the pandemic. That didn't help some of our hospitality members and other things where you had hotels and other things closed down during the pandemic. The president also issued a Buy American, Hire American executive order that required a review of H all H2B workers. And as part of that review, it did not come to pass or be finalized into any regulation, but um, that group had floated significant restrictions on the J-1 visa program. That's the cultural exchange visa. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that one of those proposals was that you could not use as an employer both the J-1 visa program and the H-2B visa program. And we know that some of our members in the hospitality space use both. So if you're a hotel, you might be using the J-1 visas for some of those um, front, front desk positions, um, some of those where you're at interacting more with a guest and you still using H2B visa kitchen um, workers for, um, you know, to serve as waiters or clearing um, tables in some of the hotel restaurants or things like that. And then of course the president did issue several border security actions starting with several executive orders with his first month in the administration. Um, one of those that was later overturned by the courts was a ban on Muslims entering this country and so that was later overturned, but that was where we saw some initial action um, by the president's first term. So what do we expect in the 
in his second term, especially in the, the first few years. We do expect that there will be um, some efforts to limit, invoke, or not extend DACA protections or temporary protected status. TPS de designations are for a period of time, and then they would need to be renewed. So we would expect that the president may not renew TPS when it's expiring for um, migrants from several countries, and that we may not see any new TPS designations issued even if there's more unrest in certain parts of the world. Um, we definitely express increased audits uh, for anyone using the program, but the good thing is um, FEWA really has prepared all of our members for audits and those audits that we saw increased audits in the first Trump administration have really continued during the Biden administration. So um, while an audit can be scary, um, if you listen to your FEWA um, team members and really prepare you know what to expect and can get through those without much issue. But we do expect there to be a lot more scrutiny, a lot more conversation on all of the work visa programs. Um, we expect some more push for mandatory E-Verify, but that is something that would need to be enacted in legislation. And obviously there's going to be a lot of focus on border security, detention, deportations, a lot of calls for more funding um, from the administration and we expect that Republican House and Senate will issue more funding for more border detention, more border security, completing the wall, detention facilities, and a lot more deportations. But the initial focus, we believe, in the very short order, would be to focus on um, deporting anyone who has broken the law, who has a criminal record. Um, you know, the president wants mass deportation, but we'll see how that unfolds as you, it's really hard to. Um, deport everyone who's currently undocumented or working in the United States. Um, but that is certainly going to be a quick focus of the new administration when the president is sworn in on January 20th. So if you can go to the next slide, please. We did want to talk a little bit about um, some of the appointments that we've seen from the um, Trump, from President-elect Trump so far. Um, he has appointed um, Governor Kristi Noem to head the Department of Homeland Security. Of course, she and other um, cabinet secretary appointees will need Senate confirmation. There's no reason to indicate that she wouldn't be confirmed by the United States Senate. Um, she was in the House before she was elected governor of South Dakota, and she has really been very harsh in South Dakota on border security. She has really focused um, a lot of her rhetoric and a lot of her time as governor on securing the border, even calling up South Dakota National Guard to defend the border, even though South Dakota is not a, a border state on the southern border. Um, but one of the things she has done when she was in the House, she had weighed in and supported H2B cap relief, recognizing the importance of the H2B program to South Dakota and its hospitality industry. And even as governor, while she was calling for a lot more border security, supporting border wall funding, use of the National Guard, all of those things, she did have a press conference at, at Mount Rushmore and welcome H2B workers to the, to the state to support the state's hospitality. So um, at least there is a recognition there that there's a difference between undocumented H2B workers, the pressure at the border, and then folks that are coming in on non-immigrant visas like H2A and H2B workers. So, um, there's a little bit of a positive story there. Um, President Trump did invite, um, say he was appointing Tom Homan, the former director of Immigration Customs Enforcement, to oversee his planned deportation as a, quote, border czar. Um, this is not a legal cabinet position. This would be a position in the White House that would not require any kind of Senate confirmation. Um, Homan was really recognized as, uh, in a positive way, under President Obama, where he was at ICE, for really kind of organizing deportations by focusing on those with criminal records. Um, and then he got a lot of criticism under the Trump administration, where he took a lot of those efforts a step for, further, and he was kind of the author of the family separation plan of, of bringing uh, those migrants who are coming into the country and separating them. And everyone remembers the conversations about separating migrant families and having children separated from their families. That um, initial policy was, was a home and policy call. Um, so he will be leading those efforts on what 
President-elect Trump is calling mass deportations. Um, and we will see how that, how that will all unfold. Next slide, please, Arnifo. The president has elected, um, nominated Marco Rubio, the current senator from Florida, to be his next secretary of state. Um, he's a more traditional Republican. He had, back in 2017, been one of the gang of senators, the bipartisan gang of senators that put together a comprehensive immigration reform bill that did have permanent H-2B returning worker exemption, had um, H-2A reforms, including a path to legal status for H-2A workers and some, some pro-industry H-2B reforms. But he has since in um, subsequent years become much more of a border hawk and, and much more stronger in his rhetoric and his actions around um, undocumented workers. Um, he's not been outspoken against the H-2A or H-2B programs, but he's certainly not been a leader in promoting any kind of reform there either. Um, and then uh, somebody else will be appointed to fill his seat. We do expect confirmation for him. Um, he's well liked among his Senate peers, and there's no reason to think he wouldn't be confirmed quickly. And then um, Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida would appoint somebody to fill out the remainder of his term. Uh, President Trump's chief of staff, again, that's not a confirmation requiring position, um, is Susie Wiles. I think folks looked at that as a pretty good, solid um, chief of staff, someone who has been the gatekeeper and very engaged in her campaign. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, one of the things that I think bears mentioning is the president's um, election for his next deputy chief of staff, so to sort of right under Susie Wiles, and that is Stephen Miller. He was a key policy advisor um, in the past Trump White House and Trump's campaign. Um, after leaving office, he founded the America First Legal Foundation, really challenging Biden administration policies, especially a lot of things, been a very vocal anti-immigration uh, member of the Trump inner circle. Uh, and anti-immigration, not only focusing on those folks that are here in the country undocumented or coming into the country, but also against the visa programs. And a few years ago, we had, um, under the Trump administration, there was an, a bill in Homeland, in the Appropriations Committee that would have created a returning worker exemption. And it was Stephen Miller who was really weighing in and, and kind of opposing that from the White House, even though the White House didn't take official position. So certainly someone that posed a challenge for us before and will continue to pose a challenge for us. And we do not know who the Secretary of, of Labor is. Um, there, there are several nominees out there. We'll see where it remains to be seen who the next Secretary of Labor will be. Um, traditionally, in the and in the past Trump administration, We'd seen a lot more challenges um, with the, the H-2B program and the H-2A program just on policy-wise coming from the Departments of Homeland Security um, under the Trump administration and had found the Department of Labor much easier to work with. That has switched during the Biden administration. A lot of our challenges, like the new H-2A rule that came out recently and is, is subject to legal challenge, um, have come out of the Department of Labor, whereas the Department of Homeland Security under the Biden administration really um, understood more the need for um, H-2B supplemental visas. And so, you know, we know how to work with this construct. Um, all of this sounds pretty frightening, but we do know that the um, we've worked with this administration before. We'll work with the new players. And thanks to all of our members, we have a really good grassroots network and really good relationships on Capitol Hill that will help weigh in with the new administration, but also moving efforts on, on cap relief forward. It will certainly, we will have our challenges and uphill battle, but we know how to do this. And one of the things I will report here as well is we um, the rule on creating supplemental visas for fiscal year 2025 has been submitted from the Department of Homeland Security to the Office of Management and Budget. Um, we don't know the substance of that rule, but the Office of Management and Budget in the White House is review is required to look at a host of economic factors and other things before a regulation can be finalized. Um, but we do believe that the Biden administration is moving to 
finalize a rule on supplemental H2V visas that will look very akin to what we saw for fiscal year 24, releasing the almost 65,000 supplemental visas with set-asides for the Northern Triangle and Northern Central American countries. A couple countries were added in 24 to that um, batch of, of countries and um, having the remaining supplemental visas be for returning workers and having them released during time. So set aside of, of visas for the first um, first half cap and then for the second half cap with a few um, a thousand of those visas being dedicated for late season filers, those that are not looking at April 1st filing, uh, April 1st start dates for their workforce. Um, next slide, please. And I did just want to quickly, and then we really want time for questions, to show that, you know, the committees that we have been working for and the relationships that FEWA has with, with senators and members of Congress and um, that, that you all have built through through um, thanks to all of your advocacy and reach out to your own members coming to our FEWA fly-ins, um, answering all of our new folks' emails to call your member of Congress. Um, most of those members are still going to be there. While there's a sea change in terms of, of leadership that we're going to have Republican leadership in all three um, branches of, of the government, well, not three branches, in, in the legislative and, and executive branches, um, and the Supreme Court actually with, with appointees um, from the last Trump administration, um, the number of, and the amount of changes in terms of your own members of Congress, chances are most of them are not changing. Um, as you can see here on the Republican side, the only change we really expect is that Senator Rubio will be moving into the administration as Secretary of State. A couple of changes on the Democratic side with some retirements or lost elections. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm showing you just this, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, um, because that committee, while it's not something we've traditionally lobbied on in terms of H2B visas and CATs, it is the committee that has to uh, confirm before the full Senate does the new um, Secretary of Labor. And we have seen some hearings um, on worker visa programs and, and the needs of the workforce in the Senate Health Committee. So we'll just put this up for your information. I know our new will probably be sharing these slides. So if you are one, any of these are members of Congress um, or senators are on some of these key committees, you can see that for yourself um, by looking at the slides. Next slide, please. Same thing with the Homeland Security Committee. Before the um, Secretary of Homeland Security can be confirmed by the full Senate, there will be hearings and, and confirmation approval by the Senate Homeland Security Committee. It's an opportunity for senators to ask questions of the nominee. Um, we can decide if we want questions asked about, their, about um, her support for the H-2A and H-2B program and drawing a distinction between legal non-immigrant visas and immigration and immigrant visas and, and securing the border. So um, that is the committee. And again, these are the committees and how they looked um, for this current Congress. They will, we will have slight changes in the committees for the next Congress that could change committee ratios based on Republican and, and Democratic leaders and the numbers of Democrats and Republicans. Um, you'll have some new members appointed to fill vacancies, but generally we don't expect a lot of changes to those committees other than the ones that are um, identified here in the different color text. Next slide, please. Um, same thing with the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, the Judiciary Committees in the House and Senate are the committees that have jurisdiction over immigration. So other than appropriations and spending bills, if we are going to see any kind of immigration reform legislation moving, it will move through the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. As you can see, um, very familiar players that we are used to working with. We don't expect a lot of changes there. Next slide, please. Um, House Appropriations Committee, very important. It's been one of the committees that's really driven H2B cap relief through amendments to the annual spending bill for the Heart Homeland Security Department. We also have seen appropriation riders in the labor appropriations bill. Uh, these are the bills that fund the federal government annually um, that have been really helpful, allowing for stagger crossing for seafood workers, um, saying that, that uh, 
Department of Homeland Security and Labor can't enforce, Department of Labor cannot enforce um, the three quarter guarantee and corresponding employment provisions of 2015 regulations, allowing for a 10 month season when the latest DOL regulations allow for a season with, that can bring in workers for a maximum of nine months. Um, most of our key champions here are still here on the Appropriations Committee. Um, you know, Andy Harris, Shelley Pingree, um, Henry Cuellar, um, Dave Joyce, but one of the members who is retiring is Dutch Rubisberger from Maryland. He has been very, very helpful on the H2B program and he is retiring. Um, next slide, please. Again, the House Education and Workforce Committee. This committee has jurisdiction over the Department of Labor, among other things. And so it will have a role in any kind of review of Department of Labor programs. And that's why we put it here, just for information. Next slide, please. Um, and same thing with the House Homeland Security Committee. Um, any legislation related to operations of the Department of Homeland Security would go through the House Homeland Security Committee, but real issues and real immigration reform legislation would mainly go through the House Judiciary Committee. Um, next slide, please. And you can see there's not a lot of changes here expected to the House Judiciary Committee either um, as we look towards the next Congress. Next slide, please. So with that, um, this is just um, contact information for the entire DCLRS team. Um, this report was put together not only by myself, but all my colleagues, especially my colleague, Rita Mendez. I want to give a shout out to her um, mm -hmm. for really compiling all of the information um, that, that you saw in these slides. And with that, Arnufo, I think we can stop and turn to any questions. Perfect, Lori. Thank you. We're very grateful for you and your team to be monitoring all these details and moving pieces. Um, for one, I'm, I'm happy the elections are over and we can move on and, and you know play the game that we need to play. And, and a couple of highlights for me, and I just want to remind everybody we have Lori for a few more minutes, so please submit any questions, raise your hand. Jamie's uh, monitoring that. We can unmute your your lines if you'd like to just ask your question. But, um, you know, increased enforcement, deportations, um, you know, looking at criminals first, all that is, you know, has nothing to do with your specific H2B workers, but there's no reason why they cannot be prepared. Just, you know, as, as always keeping a copy of their uh, visa, you know, a digital copy. We know we don't want them carrying around their passport and visa with them all the time. All of them, a majority of them have phones. Uh, some employers have gone as far as keeping uh, paper copies of those in their trucks if they're in the same vehicles every year. Just, you know, there's no reason to be prepared if you're ever asked um, by any uh, official as times are changing. And this is more so for coming back of next year. Um, so just uh, there's ways to be prepared and we'll continue to monitor what's happening and, and give you points and, and things like that that you can do to help help those workers and help those individuals as, they're, as they're, they come back for the spring of next year. And one good note uh, on Lori is about the supplemental B is going through the process of, of hopefully being released very soon. We we're expecting that to happen in November, but that gives us the opportunity to file for those first half visas for those applications we've already started for many of you um, that have start dates in February and March and, and anything prior to April 1st. And all that relieves pressure for the April 1st uh, request as well. Um, so with that, Jamie, I'm going to uh, turn it over to you, see if we have any questions. want to make sure we get, uh, get that in as well. Um. Do you think the current administration will release supplemental H-2B visas before the end of the year? I think you kind of just answered that. Yeah, and we're hoping sooner rather than later. Um, we know that the administration um, pushed to get this out quickly after the elections is over. And um, and we were told it would be earlier than, than it was done in 24. Um, that Office of Management and Budget Review that I talked about um, we are, we're hopeful and, and believe that it will be very, very quick because we don't expect a lot of changes from what the rule last year. And that rule did go through that same review process last year. So stay tuned, but hopefully soon we'll have some very good news on supplemental visas. Yes, thank you. Any other questions at this time, Jamie? That looks like the only one. Perfect. All right. Well, I will go ahead, Lori. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I just wanted to echo what you said, Ornufo. All of this sounds scary and frightening, 
but um, there are a lot of things said during campaigns that can't be done without an act of Congress. Um, you can't, um, the administration cannot unilaterally dismantle the H-2A and H-2B programs that is set in law. And we have a lot of support for the programs and administration. We're gonna need all of our member support to uh, help to continue that support to build new relationships with members of Congress, especially if you are a constituent. Um, and, and so just really grateful that, that everything our members always do to engage and help us in our advocacy efforts. Um, that's gonna continue, but um, I don't want anyone to feel like this is a cause to panic. Um, your H-2B workers should be um, getting ready to come in and hopefully we'll have those supplemental visas. Getting those supplemental visas out in the Biden administration is really helpful. Then, then it's a lot harder to undo something once um, folks have already started coming in. If it were to be canceled mid-year, um, there'd be all sorts of legal challenges and due process for discriminating uh, against future um, employers who might have um, second half cap needs. So um, while, while we talked about a lot here, um, you've got such a great team in FEWA. Everyone, all of our members have been using this. They know how to be prepared in the event of an audit. Um, this is not a cause to panic. It is just a cause to say we can't let up on our advocacy efforts and we do want to ramp them up. Yes, just to kind of um, piggyback on that, you know, stay tuned. We will be hosting a fly-in, H2B fly-in. Uh, we are really just kind of looking at the congressional calendar to confirm, you know, Congress will be in session. Uh, we are looking at late February, early March. Try to get it out of your springtime, but with, you know, everybody getting sworn in, new officials in late January, it doesn't make sense to go too early. And the last thing you want to do is take time out of your busy schedule and, and fly to D.C. and talking to somebody who's going to be out <laughs> you know, not in that office or not in that position. So we have to let all that dust settle before we can get there, but please plan on that and, and attend. This is uh, most important. And a lot of these big changes we're talking about, you know, like uh, Lori mentioned, you know, we're talking 2026 season already. You know, we feel comfortable with where we're at with 25, um, with the supplemental visas that should be released soon. And hopefully we have that, that good news for you um, here, even before Thanksgiving, if not, you know, uh, much sooner than that. Um, but a couple of other points also, you know, some of the things that Lori mentioned, um, E-Verify, increased enforcement, you know, some of those things can really work to our advantage in, in negotiations in regards to permanent cap relief. And it was on the table previously. I know many of our employers would happily um, mandatory E-Verify if it meant for some type of permanent cap relief. You know, also increased enforcement, in, you know, and audits of H-2 users, you know, we're happily uh, to get rid of those bad actors, you know, more so there's a lot more users on the H-2A program simply because it's an uncapped program, but bad actors, you know, make for bad publicity uh, for these programs. So the more we can get those people out of the program, continue doing the right thing and, and respond to those audits timely, you know, we could be in a good position. So again, you know, nothing to be fearful of. We want to make sure that you're aware of all the situations that could come about um, and we'll continue to keep you updated. Um, I believe we may have one more question, Jamie, before we let everybody go. I know we're a few minutes over. Um, no, I do not see anything. Okay, perfect. Um, yes, please feel free to reach out to myself. We will circulate the uh, webinar slides along with the recording so you can share with any colleagues that may have missed and that are interested. Um, please reach out to myself directly with anything you have or your FEWA guide. They are all on as well. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Lori, for taking time today. It's very, very generous of you. Thanks. Appreciate the opportunity. Good to see everybody. Everybody have a great weekend. Thank you.